The struggle to expel the Soviet Union from Afghanistan in the 1970s and 80s gave rise to the Mujahideen. They were a wide-ranging resistance movement that brought together local tribes and foreign fighters from across the Muslim world, with the aim of liberating the Afghan people from the grips of communist rule. But when that war ended, the remnants of the Mujahideen movement became fertile ground for more dangerous ideas, giving birth to two groups that would dominate headlines for the next three decades, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. In 1979, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan to prop up a weak communist government that had taken power in a coup a year earlier. In response, a number of Afghan groups mounted a rebellion. They consisted mostly of unionists and university students and called themselves the Mujahideen, an Islamic term describing those fighting in the path of righteousness. The Soviets responded by launching intense military crackdowns around the country to stamp out opposition. This forced many of the fighters to retreat to neighboring Pakistan, where they set up training camps and schools in the border town of Peshawar. Here, they received funding and training from Pakistani intelligence, Saudi Arabia and the United States, all with vested interests in countering the spread of communism in the region. The most prominent of these Afghan groups were Hezbi Islami, headed by Galbuddin Hekmatyar, and Jamaat Islami, founded by Burhanuddin Rabbani, and its military wing, the Northern Alliance, which was led by guerrilla commander Ahmad Shah Mas'ud. There were many divisions over religious and political ideas as well as ethnic background, but under pressure from Pakistan and Saudi, they formed a loose umbrella group called the Peshawar 7 and began to receive advanced weaponry from the United States. Because this revolution is an Islamic revolution and it has its special aims and goals, which is to establish an Islamic, a pure Islamic system in Afghanistan, freedom of Afghanistan, and liberation of Afghanistan. Another group of people also began arriving in Peshawar, dozens of foreign volunteers from across the Muslim world eager to join the front lines of the fight. The most influential was a Palestinian scholar, Sheikh Abdullah Zem, who had declared a ruling or fatwa while teaching in Saudi Arabia that urged all able Muslims to travel to Afghanistan and take up arms against the Soviets. Azam insisted it was a religious duty to take part in the fight to free the Afghan people from the tyranny of the Red Army. Allah لا يهزم قوته لا تذل وهذا الذي غاب عن أذهان القوى الكبرى وعن أذهان الذين يدورون في فلك القوى الكبرى حتى غابت عن أذهان كثير من المسلمين الطيبين. Azam moved to Peshawar and established Maktab al Khidamat, the Arab Services Bureau, to house and organize the volunteers who began arriving and who would be nicknamed the Arab Afghans. One of those who heeded the call was a young man from one of Saudi's richest and most established families. His name was Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden rose to prominence among the volunteers due to his financial resources and connections across the Arab world, which he used to unlock a steady stream of donations to the cause. He traveled to the southern regions of Afghanistan with a group of volunteers and fought alongside the Mujahideen fighters, and slowly the tide began to turn against the Soviets. As stories of the Mujahideen spread across the Muslim world, invigorated by the passionate writings of Abdullah Zem, more people began to make the trek to Peshawar. Among them would be those with their own ideas of what the fight was actually about and how far it could expand. Some analysts suggest Arab governments like those in Egypt, Algeria and Jordan seized on the opportunity and released Islamist militants from their jails in the hopes they would head to Afghanistan to fight and die there. They included members of a group called Islamic Jihad, who'd been imprisoned for years in Egypt following the assassination of President Anwar Sadat in 1981. They subscribed to a doctrine that justified killing anyone who disagreed with their extreme interpretation of Islam. This included civilians, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, who were seen as heretics. Their leader was Ayman al-Zawahri, and he and a handful of other Egyptians traveled to Peshawar 
where they formed a close alliance with Osama bin Laden, who slowly grew distant from Abdullah Zem and eventually left the Arab Services Bureau to set up his own organization. By 1987, the Mujahideen had successfully retaken large parts of the country from the Soviets, whose vast empire had been in slow decay for years and on the verge of collapse. On the 20th of July, they announced their withdrawal, and the Mujahideen turned their attention to Afghanistan's communist government, who hauled itself up in Kabul until its surrender in 1992. The struggle for freedom waged by the people of Afghanistan is inspiration to free people all over the world. We have supported them in their effort to liberate their country from foreign domination and will continue that support as long as it's needed. As a free people, we can do no less, for their struggle is our struggle. But peace would not find rest, because soon the coalition government formed by the Mujahideen leaders began to fracture, and the two iconic commanders of the rebellion, Galbuddin Hekmatyar and Ahmad Shah Masoud, were at war with each other. Meanwhile, back in Peshawar, Osama bin Laden had successfully dominated the Arab camps, declaring himself as Amir, while Ayman al-Zawahiri and his group accused their former religious teacher, Abdullah Azam, of being a Saudi agent who couldn't be trusted. In November 1989, Azam was killed by a roadside bomb while leaving his house with two of his sons. Bin Laden and Zawahiri began forming a vision that extended beyond the borders of Afghanistan. They would rally Muslims everywhere to take up arms and fight against the West and its allies on their home turfs. They traveled to Sudan and began supporting other militant groups in Algeria and Egypt to carry out acts of terror against their oppressive regimes and the civilians who refused to fight. Where would you attack Islam? When they returned to Afghanistan, they found a new Afghan group had emerged amid the chaos of the ongoing civil war. They called themselves Taliban, or students, and had formed in the religious schools of Peshawar in response to the power vacuum caused by the new government's collapse that had left large parts of the country defenseless and overrun with crime. Led by their religious leader, Mullah Muhammad Omar, the Taliban promised to rescue the Afghan people from the tyranny of the warlords and restore the country to Islamic rule. With backing from Pakistani intelligence, they swept through the country and placed Kabul under siege for two years, before taking the capital in 1996 and establishing the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. They installed a strict punitive code, restricting the dress and behavior of Afghans and stamping out any perceived Western cultural influences. Under their protection, bin Laden continued to operate quietly, using his extensive financing networks to link up with similar-minded militants in the Middle East Africa and the US to plot attacks against their new imperial enemy. In February 1998, he published his message to the world in a London-based Arabic newspaper Al-Quds Al-Arabi, in which he issued his first fatwa as a self-declared emir of Muslims. The ruling to kill all Americans and their allies, civilians and military is an individual duty for every Muslim who can do it in any country in which it is possible to do it in order to liberate the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Holy Mosque from their grip, and in order for their armies to move out of all lands of Islam, defeated and unable to threaten any Muslim. That year, a car bombing targeted two US embassies in Tanzania and Kenya, killing more than 200 people and putting him and his organization on the map. The US declared its old Mujahid ally a wanted terrorist and announced his group's name to the world, Al-Qaeda. The foundation. Bin Laden publicly vowed to wage a terrorist war against America. We will not yield to this threat. 
we will meet it no matter how long it may take. This will be a long, ongoing struggle between freedom and fanaticism, between the rule of law and terrorism. One of their followers, the Jordanian Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, would later travel to Iraq to set up a branch of Al-Qaeda, which would ignite a brutal sectarian war following the US invasion and later transform into the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, ISIS. Another was the Pakistani Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who would begin to seek their help in his ambitious plan to take their jihad to US shores. On the 9th of September 2001, the head of the Northern Alliance, Ahmed Shah Mas'ud, was assassinated by two men posing as journalists. It's widely believed to have been the work of Al-Qaeda in retaliation for a visit Mas'ud made earlier that year to the European Parliament, where he warned the United States that it could be a target of an attack if it didn't take the situation in Afghanistan seriously. <laughs> Two days after his death, Our war on terror begins with Al Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. And tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. These demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. The Taliban must act and act immediately. They will hand over the terrorists or they will share in their fate. <laughs>